Hey everybody, I'd like to welcome Matt Bowler to the screen today. Matt is our composer for the world premiere of Marginalia, which is a new song cycle for three voices and three instrumentalists that we are premiering here, right here at Victory Hall Opera next month on February yes. 18th. Just still next, just next month. Hi, Matt. Hi, Ben Miriam. It's so good to see you. You too. Hey, so tell me, what's the big deal about marginalia? Why should we care about things that have been written in people's books, you know, complete strangers? Why should we care about that? Well, I don't know if I can tell people why they should care about it, but I can definitely tell you why I find it interesting. And, uh, um, I mean, not only is it just the idea of people, uh, not just people who have written texts for books, so who have like passed, who have taken the time to formulate ideas and put them into books and put them into documents and then they're printed, but the idea that people who interacted with these books um, are actually speaking to us from the stacks um, is interesting. I just, I also have a very emotional reaction to these, which I wasn't expecting when I, when the idea was first floated to me by uh, both of you. I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, let's read some of them. And the folks over at the Book Traces Project, the real heroes of this, I think, uh, Andy Stauffer and Kristen Jensen, uh, the, the amount of data that they compiled with this and, uh, and reading these entries, uh, you feel, um, I feel a, a little voyeuristic. You're reading these very, very, uh, very personal things. Uh, it, it's, it, it, I feel sometimes when I, I'm uh, looking at some of these things that have been left behind in these books, like I'm seeing something, a glimpse into these people's lives, uh, the people who live just as you and I do, uh, in a very, very personal way. I mean, there's always that, uh, what's that uh, quote that says, uh, I suppose if it refers to writing diaries and journals, if one does one does not write something down if one does not wish it to be read. I suppose there is the head, but nonetheless, there is something really personal and private about seeing these mementos from the past. And so it's not just the things, uh, you know, these books uh, become precious objects unto themselves, not because of the actual uh, written text that is in it, but because of the hands that held that book. Uh, I, I think... It's, it's really beautiful and really poignant and powerful. Mm -hmm. Great. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the specific examples that you chose for to make the libretto? Because Matt also compi compiled the libretto for this song cycle, which is not always the case. But with the help of the Book Traces Project leaders, um, Matt, you, you found some things that you really responded to. Can you just tell us a little bit about the, the, the snippets, a couple of the snippets maybe that you chose and, and why, why they spoke to you? Certainly, it was very, very. It was a very challenging process, simply because uh, the folks over at the, the team of the Book Traces Project had compiled. I think they read, they cataloged over one hundred thousand books, um, and the and the pieces that I, I mean, that's kind of amazing. Uh, and the things that they found were, you know, very, very tiny fragments to uh, much larger segments of text, even things like uh, um, dried flowers, locks of hair, paper dolls. Um, the things that spoke to, uh, and it took a long time because there was so much choice and there was so much rich material. I remember thinking there was a week, about a week when I came down to visit, uh, there was one specific woman who, uh, uh, Amelie Reeves, who had such an interesting backstory and such an interesting amount of marginalia. I thought for sure, oh, well, this, the whole thing is going to be about her. Um, it really was a process of making this, uh, just finding things that speak most immediately without a lot of backstory because marginalia itself by its nature you're looking at a book which has text and then the text next to it is referential to the the uh, the printed text mm -hmm. so if the challenge was finding a way to translate something a visual uh, a vis a, something that's visual into something that's aural and something that exists like temporally right mm -hmm. uh, so some of the things that I've uh, one of the things one of the things that I found uh, the, the most, one of the most famous ones on the uh, website was the uh, inscription uh, that was left in a copy of Tennyson's Enoch Arden, 
uh, and it's a note from a one gentleman to another uh, saying, 19 years ago, we were in Richmond together, and you read this poem to me aloud, and here I am 19 years later in Rotterdam, and I find a Dutch copy of this book, and it reminds me that we read this book together, and it reminds me of how much I think of you and how dear to me our time has been. And of, I mean, of course, I paraphrase that poorly, but the fact that uh, there's something that intimate and that personal, and then you add another layer on top of that, the Book Traces team did a little bit of research and they found out 19 years ago, these two gentlemen were co Confederate soldiers. And this was written in, a, they would have been reading this book together uh, right at a time when uh, Richmond was in great peril at the, the, close to the very end of the Civil War. So this beautiful thing, uh, that uh, this beautiful memory that was shared was during a very, very ugly time. So there's a lot of, so the, it's so beautiful to, it's not beautiful, it's interesting to see uh, something so beautiful in such an ugly context. And a lot of times that is what interested me with the specific selections was not only um, the text itself, but uh, by dint of some of the research uh, that the Book Traces folks have done, what the context is. And that's why I found some of these things very interesting. Yes. Great. So when you start, when you find those snippets, when something triggers the imagination, mm -hmm. I mean, I think a lot of us wonder, who, a lot of us who aren't composers wonder, where does that melody come from? Where, does that, where, does, where do you start to put notes down on a page? Do you see music as a, is it a color? Is it, a, is it a, an image? Is it a narrative that starts to form in your head? What's, what's your starting place? Well, certainly with, uh, it's, I think it's a little different with every project, but certainly with this project, um, a, a lot of my composing work on this was done by compiling and structuring the libretto. Right. Um, we actually made uh, the, the, the part where you put dots down on paper, like the kind of especially, um, you know, uh, laborious part, uh, a little bit, a little bit easier. Um, I didn't think of... Uh, it's it's not a magical thing. Honestly, composing is, uh, is not about inspiration. Um, it's about getting to the desk and uh, and putting those little dots on paper one at a time. There's a uh, um, the writer Neil Gaiman uh, actually has a wonderful uh, little bit a little metaphor that he talks about when he's writing, um, and he he says it's uh, like those stone walls, those very, very long stone walls that run along the borders, uh, like in England, say, and they like these stone walls that there's, there's no mortar in between them, but they're just built with only stones. Yeah. And they have this tremendous strength and they last for millennia and centuries. And, and he says, what you do is you find one, one word, one stone, you put it in place. And then you find the stone that fits with that one. And eventually you find the next stone that fits with that one. And eventually you have a wall. Um, I I feel that that uh, that, that was part. I, I, I didn't. Sometimes you have inspiration, but that's very very rare. What you what you, you just put it together slowly. You're, uh, for me, um, the ideas are always very small, and then you expand outward. Um, uh, the challenge with the longer piece. This this is the longest piece that I've written. Um, is writing something in the moment for your characters and for your players, but having an eye out of your periphery vision, kind of going, is this going the direction that I want it to go? So th those would be the challenges, but I, I don't hear, I'm not messian, I don't have synesthesia, I don't hear <laughs> colors, I don't get images. Um, the, the, the text certainly uh, told me, and the, and the characters uh, told me what I needed to do. Right. And that's so esoteric, <laughs> but it's not, that's, so in this case, uh, you're writing for specific voices, um, for my own uh, voice, as well as Brenda Patterson and uh, Will Ferguson. We are all singers who you've worked with and who you, whose, whose voices you know quite well. Does that help or is that a hindrance? Oh my God, not a hindrance at all. Oh my goodness, it's, it's such <laughs> a help. Uh, I mean, just as a specific example, uh, you told me that you have a wicked float. Uh, <laughs> for, for, the, for those who don't know, that's when a soprano or, or a higher voice is able to sing 
at a very, very soft volume, very, very high in their range. And it's not something that everybody can do and everybody can do well. So, now, Matt um, has written me one of these wicked floats, so the pressure is on to make it truly, <laughs> right. make it truly wicked. Um, uh, but uh, knowing the specific uh, ins and outs of, uh, of a colleague's voice uh, of someone and writing for someone is, is a great gift uh, because you can you want your performers to feel comfortable and feel like they can shine and feel like they can uh, be in the moment of the music without having to navigate um, an obstacle course. <laughs> uh, we've all had, I mean, as a singer myself, we've all had to sing music that is an obstacle course and you're, it, it's, and you feel lucky to be alive at the end of singing. <laughs> but so, so, so it's not only, uh, it's not only a blessing to, uh, have, to know specific voices, but to actually to know something about all of you as, uh, act, actors and humans. And there are moments, I mean, I won't, we can talk about it after the show is done, but there are moments where I was writing the show. It's like, I remember when Miriam had that one moment in Rosen Cab, and I wonder if she can access that again. Maybe I'll give her some material that will give her the option if she wants to explore that acting direction she might be able to. That's really, that's really interesting. And, um, and probably yeah. quite a rare, I think, relationship for composers to have with their with their singers, but not unheard of. It reminds me a little bit of, I guess, what Britton must have experienced writing all of his roles for Peter Pears, that sort of intimacy that means, wow, I don't only know what your voice can do, I know who you are and, you know, yeah. what maybe triggers a certain sound coming out of your body, you know, that's, that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, Matt, so you're a singer, obviously, and you're a... You're now a composer as well. Is this? Do you think it's going to be necessary for you to choose at some point a career, one or the other, or do you think that, that are we moving into a time when the industry is uh, going to be a little more accepting and open to the idea of this kind of hybrid career? I think the the latter certainly, and certainly that's uh, it's no coincidence that that's what is at the heart of BHO's mission, right? Uh, we it's a a sort of Steppenwolf for singers. And, uh, and it recognizes the fact that, uh, um, yeah, th there are a lot of uh, talented artists out there um, who are able to do more than one thing and do it well. I think, yeah, certainly there was, um, and it has to do maybe with uh, the changing uh, vibe uh, in what's happening in the opera world. I mean, it's not, uh, in the gig economy, there are fewer and fewer people you know, who, uh, fewer, fewer, fewer places, especially outside of opera, where um, it's the top down. Like normally, as singers, we're hired guns. We're brought in to do this, uh, and I think it's very, very exciting. There are a lot of people out there, right? Now. Actually, a lot of singers that are also doing uh, great things. Certainly, uh, David Adam Moore uh, is a, a wonderful baritone, but he's also um, uh, uh, doing multimedia art and Peabody Southwell, she's a mezzo and she's also a costume designer and dramaturg and certainly all of you. So I think this is, uh, I mean, it's so hard to like talk about the time that you're in, but right now I think this, the, the idea of being Renaissance people is having a, forgive me, Renaissance. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. I, I think you're right. So, um, Matt, I'm going to leave it there and we are, very excited to have you in town present at the at the premiere on uh, February 18th and look forward to breathing life into this great new piece. I am very much looking forward to it as well. I could not ask for a better team. I'm so excited. All right. Great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Take care, Miriam. <laughs>